uh, coming up, we have uh, uh, Jeff Landis and uh, Bill Nesmith. And um, yeah, so I'll, I will go ahead and introduce uh, Jeff, I guess. So, so Dr. Landis actually did his PhD in uh, solid state physics at Brown. So I'm a condensed matter physicist uh, back in my training. So I, I appreciate that background. We can talk about, um, I don't know, uh, periodic boundary conditions or something if we if we have extra time, but I don't think we will. <laughs> so, um, you know, he's um, he's got quite a long history um, at uh, NASA Glenn um, on all sorts of missions, uh, uh, Mars and so on. And so he's done a lot of work, especially in uh, in this area. And I also want to call out that he's done a lot of uh, science fic fiction writing. So I, I recommend picking up his uh, short stories, uh, maybe a hundred or so of those, I think, and he's uh, awarded for those as well. So I'm curious and interested in, interested in hearing the narrative that he uh, lays out for us uh, today. Uh, so Jeff, if you're there and ready, you can go ahead and uh, take over. I see he's in the panel, but maybe he's not. Uh... Oh, there he comes, unmuted. Okay. And there, <laughs> great. So great. Let's see if I can share my screen here. And, okay, is that showing up? Yep, we've got your main screen with the PowerPoint there. Okay. Okay. Oh, we've okay. got the we've got the presenters view though. You need oh, to darn, switch the, the wrong order. Let's see. Here I think it's switch the left. upper in the yeah. upper left hand corner. There's a swap displays there button. There you go. Okay. Excellent. Great. Thank you. So, Thank you for that introduction. And I just want to talk a little bit about the specific application of power beaming uh, for lunar shadowed craters. Uh, but first, uh, as we know, uh, sending electrical power over beams has a long history of being proposed for space. I mean, here is Peter Glazer's original concept, uh, some later concepts of Earth to space and space to Earth and space to space power beaming. We've been looking at this for a long, uh, long time. Uh, unfortunately, previously, just no applications have been so compelling that we could justify the large initial investment. I've been a member of some teams that have been looking at this, and the typical scale has been, oh, if we just spend a billion dollars on lasers and beam directors, in 10 years, it'll pay for itself. Well, unfortunately, that's really a non-starter. Uh, applications have to start small. I'll actually give you a little trivia question here. Uh, we now fly solar-powered missions uh, with powers of over 100 kilowatts. So the question is, what was the power level on the first solar-powered satellite? I'll give you a minute to think about that, and then I'll just give you the answer. The answer is one watt. Uh, so the way technology development works is to start with a low power application and then evolve to higher power applications. Well, this is something that we all know, I think. Uh, the shadowed regions of the moon uh, seem to have frozen volatiles such as water ice. They're of extreme interest. Uh, they are, of course, frozen because they never get sunlight. Uh, the fact that they never get sunlight uh, makes it a little bit difficult for operation of our standard solar powered systems. Uh, so this is a problem. Uh, one possible solution to it is to use a beamed power system to send power directly to a rover. So we've already talked about this a couple of times. I probably shouldn't uh, emphasize it too much, but the power source is on the illuminated rim of a dark crater. Uh, we use some sort of beam, and I'll give a couple of choices in a second, and a collector on the rover converts that beamed energy into electrical power. Uh, well, the beaming approaches that we've been talking about are microwave power, laser power, and millimeter power, uh, all of which could potentially be used as sources for power beaming. Uh, well, microwaves, of course, have been posed, proposed for power beaming since the 70s, uh, when Peter Glazer proposed satellite solar power stations uh, to beam power from space uh, to the Earth. 
typically they're in the range of 2.45 gigahertz to 5.8 gigahertz. Uh, a lot of work been done at 2.45. That's your microwave oven frequency. Uh, the nice thing about the microwave oven frequency is that the technology for making low cost, high efficiency microwave sources at microwave over oven frequencies is way down the learning curve. Uh, it's a well-developed uh, technique. Uh, it's usually proposed to use magnetron tubes. They're cheap and efficient. There's a lot to be said for moving up a little bit to higher uh, frequencies, however. But the nice thing is it's relatively easy to get pretty good DC to RF conversion efficiency. Uh, the receiver technology is by rectennas, rectifying antennas. Uh, they're less well developed because there are not 100 million people uh, using uh, rectennas, well, while there are 100 million people using microwave ovens, uh, but the efficiencies are pretty good. The record efficiency is 91.4%. I should probably have checked that with Paul Jaffe uh, to make sure that nobody's beat that recently. But, but typically you have non-ideal conditions. You typically get more like 80% under under more real, real world conditions. Uh, so a lot to be said for microwave beaming. Uh, laser beaming has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the laser systems have narrow beam width and they can beam power to photovoltaic cells, another pretty well-developed technology. People have proposed wavelengths ranging from about 500 nanometers, uh, typically up to about 1.1 microns, uh, 1100 nanometers. A couple of people have proposed up to 1550 nanometers. Uh, the longer IR range around 1.5 microns has, does have the advantage of being iSafe. I should point out that at the power levels we're talking about, iSafe is not necessarily really iSafe. What it would be is perhaps less I unsafe. Still, in terms of getting the safety permit for your lab. There's a lot to be said for that 1550 nanometers. Uh, nevertheless, I'll mostly be talking about uh, ranges more around one micron. Conversion efficiency for transmitters is not as good as microwave. The best lasers come in about 50 to 60%. The higher the beam quality, I uh, tend to have a little bit lower efficiency, not tremendously lower, but slightly lower. And the efficiency does depend on wavelength. Uh, receiver technologies are photovoltaic cells. Turns out to be pretty easy to get 50% efficiency uh, if the photovoltaic cell technology is matched to the wavelength of the laser. Uh, nice thing is these cells in this range will also convert solar light, uh, typically about half of the efficiency of the monochromatic laser light. Uh, nevertheless, it's kind of nice to be able to use sunlight uh, if it's available, it's just sitting there. So if you have a rover that's sometimes in the daylight, sometimes at night, uh, you can only use the possibly uh, more expensive laser power uh, when you need it, when you're in the dark. And uh, the receiver technology is also moderately well-developed. Although of course, most of the development is for solar photovoltaics, not laser photovoltaics. Uh, millimeter wave is sort of a hybrid between the two. It's shorter wavelength than microwaves, not as short as uh, lasers. Hasn't been proposed very much for most of the power beaming applications uh, because it has poor path length through clouds or if the air is humid. So less people are looking at that because a lot of people are looking at power beaming for earth. But typical frequencies are in the W band, oh, 90 gigahertz or so. That gives you a wavelength uh, down to maybe three millimeters and the shorter wavelengths allow a narrower beam for the transmitter size. I'll look at that in a little more detail in a second. The beam technology is less well-developed. Uh, there's not as much uh, high power, 90 gigahertz, uh, but the technology is improving amazingly rapidly because it's being developed for the next generation telecom. Receiver technology, likewise less de well-developed, I'm seeing efficiencies of about 35% at those W band frequencies, uh, but there's a lot of room for improvement just because so few people are looking at millimeter wave uh, rectennas uh, up to date. So let's talk a little bit about spot size. 
Uh, in the diffraction limit, the spot size and the target is strictly a function of the transmitter lens diameter, and more specifically in the ratio of the diameter to the wavelength. So the bigger the lens, the smaller the spot. Likewise, the smaller the wavelength, uh, the smaller the spot. I like this particular equation uh, that actually gives the diameter to the first uh, area minimum in the area pattern. And I should point out that this only is strictly accurate uh, for a completely coherent beam. Uh, if the beam has poor coherence, uh, the spot size uh, will be bigger. And I'll last point out that this is the minimum spot size. It's relatively easy to make a bigger spot size, uh, but it's physically impossible or pushes <laughs> some of the bounds of physics uh, to make a smaller spot size. Uh, so let's look at how big that spot size is. Here's a 50 centimeter beam director. Uh, that's about the size of an amateur telescope, uh, a decent amateur telescope, uh, but not something that you don't see if you go out to your local star party. Uh, at microwaves, at uh, one kilometer away, at say 29 meter spot, uh, that's huge. Millimeter waves, you get it down to 1.6 meters, uh, but for a laser at one micron, uh, it's a tiny spot, it's half of a centimeter. Uh, so the 50 centimeter beam director, uh, the microwave beam is just too large, even for a, even at the shortest distance, the microwave spread out too much. Millimeter might be reasonable at the shortest distances, but pretty large areas uh, once you get to kilometers. Laser spot sizes are small. So this is the push for lasers. Uh, but let's now look at a 2.5 meter uh, beam director. That's typically a small satellite uplink dish. It's not particularly large in the way of apertures. So for the microwaves now, uh, at 500 meters, a pretty short beaming distance, it's maybe more reasonable, uh, 2.9 uh, meter diameter. For millimeter waves, it's a reasonable diameter spot size, even out to a kilometer or two. Uh, only 30 centimeters at a kilometer, uh, proportionally larger further away. And the laser now is so tiny that uh, actually diffraction limit isn't even going to be the limit anymore. It'll be limited probably by other problems with the beam. So for a 2.5 meter beam director, the microwave is large, but not completely unreasonable as long as you're short compared to a kilometer. Millimeter beam spread is reasonable up to a couple kilometers. The laser spot sizes remain small. Uh, so people just keep, always somebody pops up and says, well, why are we using lasers? Why don't we just reflect the sunlight from a mirror? Can't you do that? Well, the answer is yes, you can reflect sunlight, uh, but no, uh, sunlight has terrible beam spread. Uh, the sun has an angular diameter of about half a degree. So if you reflect sunlight, uh, that angular diameter is retained. The beam divergence remains 0 0.5 degrees. And no, you can't change that with clever optical design. Actually, that's the law of physics. Uh, it's called conservation of Hindu. Uh, you cannot, you can only reduce that uh, angular spread in one direction by increasing it in the other. So that gives a divergence of about one centimeter per beaming distance. So, okay, maybe over 100 meters uh, beaming distance, that might be reasonable, but longer than that, you need either very, very large mirrors uh, or small beaming distances to get a reasonable uh, power density. And that is ignoring the surface quality of the mirror. A lot of people propose lightweight membrane mirrors that look like solar sails. Uh, they have much worse problems focusing to a spot. In fact, there was a NASA mission called Flashlight, Lunar Flashlight, that was going to use a solar sail to reflect light down into a lunar pole or crater uh, just as a flashlight to say, hey, what does it look like? Because of course, we've never seen the interior of these craters because they're dark all the time. There's no light, you can't see it. Uh, but actually that mission eventually uh, switched over and said, we have to use a laser to illuminate and that's simply because you can't maintain a good enough beam quality uh, 
on the lightweight solar sail, even a very small amount of ripple uh, in the membrane uh, means that you don't get good beam quality. So yeah, for some applications, you might be able to reflect sunlight, uh, but not really for these 100 meter distances, kilometer distance, 10 kilometer distances. Uh, so the real answer, I think, is that it's a different technology for different applications. Microwave power beaming is good for the big systems where sizes are large anyway, and you want that efficiency. You need that 90% uh, efficient magnetron tube. Uh, or they're also good for short distances, perhaps, where the beam spread is not the limiting parameter. Uh, laser power beaming is the opposite. It might be good for small systems where you need to keep it small and good for long distances where the beam spread is the issue. Millimeter wave is actually promising. It's a compromise between size and efficiency, uh, but the technology needs a bit of developing. Let me just point out the little footnote here is I haven't talked about near field power coupling, such as inductive coupling. Uh, that's just because we're looking at this lunar uh, polar shadowed crater region where approaches that can beam power over distances of centimeters to maybe a meter uh, aren't applicable, but they may also have applications uh, as well. So I'm only not considering them because of the particular application. There's other applications they may be useful. So let me go and talk a little bit more about details for uh, laser power beaming uh, applications. Uh, the choice of laser is very important. Uh, there's really four criteria that you need. Uh, first, you need a high electrical to optical conversion efficiency. Otherwise, you lose all of your power in the laser. Uh, among other things, the heat rejection becomes a, a limiting factor. Uh, the receiver, the solar cell, has to also have a high optical to electrical conversion efficiency. That particularly means you have to choose the laser wavelength to match the receiver that you picked. Uh, it has to be a laser that you can make in high power. If you have tremendously efficient lasers, but they only put out one milliwatt, it's not really going to do you much good. And you do need to have high beam quality. Uh, previously, I talked about diffraction limited beam. In a second, I'll talk about uh, beams of low beam quality. Uh, so just looking at that beam quality, uh, if you have a low coherence light source, uh, you now are not limited by the diffraction limit. Well, you're still limited by diffraction limited, but uh, your main uh, problem is now going to be classical optics. So the high coherence light source can get you as good as the diffraction limit. Turns out there's two very high efficiency wavelength technologies that one might use. Uh, the di diode laser bars have exemplary efficiency in a good wavelength, uh, but turns out they have low coherence. In fact, my late friend Jordan Kerr used to say, oh, essentially the diode laser bars are flashlights. They're not really lasers, because the light output is not in perfect phase. Uh, to get better beam quality, to get high coherence, there are diode pumped lasers. Uh, for example, fiber lasers, uh, where the light output is in phase. So if you choose the laser based on efficiency, uh, those are your choices. Looking a little bit now at that incoherent optics. In the incoherent optics, the size of the beam is a projected image of the emitting aperture. Uh, so actually, the size is the ratio of the distance from the lens to the target uh, divided by the distance uh, from the emitter to the lens. So you say, oh, well, OK, maybe we can solve that uh, problem by just making a very long uh, F1, the first focal length. Uh, but here's just an example. If the aperture is about a millimeter, pretty small mil aperture, uh, and a focal length of uh, 25 centimeters, it's about a foot and you're beaming at only 200 meters, uh, that uh, incoherent laser spot will be 80 centimeters uh, in diameter. Well, so you say, well, why can't you just make the focal length really long? Uh, that's fine, except that light sources have an intrinsic divergence. 
and that divergence is typically in the order of a radian. Uh, so you can't make a long focal length uh, unless you have an inordinately large diameter lens. Uh, so you can change that expression for the size of the spot instead of as, as a function of the uh, ratio of the focal lengths. Uh, you can change that into the ratio of the diameter of the lens and the F number. Uh, but the quick answer is uh, if you want a long focal length F1, uh, you need a pretty big lens. Uh, I did mention you have to pick the solar cell for the converter to match the wavelength that your uh, laser puts out. And here's just a typical graph. This is an old one this is from a paper I wrote, I think 20 years ago, uh, but it shows some typical uh, solar cells. And it turns out the conversion efficiency rises pretty much linearly with wavelength up to a cutoff wavelength, at which point it drops abruptly to zero. Uh, so that cutoff wavelength is well known. It's from the Einstein equation, energy equals HC over, over lambda. Uh, so you can pick a photovoltaic cell to match the laser, or for that matter, you can pick a laser to match the photovoltaic cell. Uh, in fact, the semiconductor device manufacturers are getting pretty good now at uh, being able to grab any uh, band gap material that you want. Uh, but turns out if you grab something that they don't make uh, megawatts worth of, uh, it might end up being a little bit expensive. So I do want to talk about this program just a little bit. I don't want to steal Phil Lubin's thunder, uh, but based on these considerations, NASA put out a solicitation uh, end of last year uh, to develop wireless energy transmission technology for lunar environments. This was part of the Space Technology Research Grants Program, STRG. Uh, and it was for university teams, or at least university-led teams. And uh, the awards were just announced uh, last spring. I have to say that working with the program, I was hoping that we would give a number of awards. Turns out the budget was only enough to uh, give out one award. This is to develop, uh, analyze, and define uh, a power beaming of any sort that was left open. Could be laser, could be microwave, millimeter, could be other techniques, uh, and start to develop the technology uh, hopefully moving toward a flight demonstration, perhaps using the NASA commercial lunar uh, lander system. And the, uh, as I said, the awards were just announced in spring 2021. Uh, the university winner for this particular one, flexible power distribution, meaning wireless power beaming, uh, went to the University of California at Santa Barbara. And uh, Professor Phil Lubin, will be talking about uh, their project, I think, uh, in tomorrow's session. So with that, that's a brief introduction to power beaming for the lunar crater application. Uh, the quick conclusion, it's a plausible technology to power rovers in the permanently shattered craters. Uh, all of the technologies, microwave, millimeter wave, and laser have advocates. Uh, different technologies may be optimal for different applications depending on how much power and how far you're beaming it. There don't seem to be any showstoppers for the use of this technology for a lunar demonstration, uh, but the technology does need to be developed uh, and demonstrated in space. And with that, I'm open for questions. Great, go ahead and post your questions into the Q&A and we will start, um, and we will start uh, pulling them through. Um, so I'll, I'll start reading one here. Um, Martin McLaughlin asks, uh, if the client system has a mixed demand for DC power and heat, with heat dominating, uh, how would that impact the beam type uh, decision? Talking about the trade, well, I guess, between, yeah. Go, go. Yeah, heat would be relatively straightforward. Uh, and in fact, you get waste heat, uh, in particular in any of these systems. So that Oddly enough, if you're using the heat that 
makes the low conversion efficiency methods a little bit more attractive than they were. Uh, of course, if you get electrical power, you can always turn electrical power into heat. That's no problem. But uh, thermal energy is relatively easy. Uh, you get waste heat for free. If you need more than that, it's easier to <laughs> turn down your conversion efficiency and just accept the rest of the power in the form of heat. Yeah, I actually suspect that you know some of the issues may be the other way around, and uh, managing thermal considerations can be a you know driver of design. So um, yeah. it's sort of hopefully we can always use it as the uh, feature and not the bug. Um, uh, here's a question from Ryan Weisman. Uh, what do you say to naysayers who say that there's a physics defined upper limit to how much power can be beamed, uh, an upper limit that would painfully cap the usefulness of the technology? Well, I can't think of any physics defined upper limit. I mean, certainly the solar power satellite people uh, have been talking about beaming systems of tens Very of large. gigawatts. Yeah. Uh, I can't, can't think of a good physics limit. Uh, if you're gonna melt your mirrors eventually, yeah. mirrors <laughs> aren't, aren't perfect, but yeah. actually laser mirrors are pretty good. They're, they're well over 99.99% efficient, uh, assuming that it's, assuming they don't have dust on them. Actually dust on the mirror could be a problem, but I don't think there's a real physics defined upper limit. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think you identified the physics upper limit that people most run into with the, um, you know, just redirection. That's the one that's most obvious, right? The little dust particles can sort of explode if you hit them with a... <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, our, uh, so here's a question from Gary Barnhard. Um, what he sees is the challenge of reducing the systems engineering to practice so that you're actually serving customers um, over a developing flight tech uh, uh, dev sandbox. Um, so where do you come down on this? I guess that gets at the question of, of scaling from, from demo to something which is truly useful. Uh, there's some real insight in that. System engineering is important and is often sort of overlooked. Uh, but with that said, you can't really start doing the system engineering in detail until you have the system. So first we need to get the technology and start learning what the idiosyncrasies of the technology are. But no, I think it's uh, always something to keep in mind, uh, you know, sort of working with spacecraft development, you have mm -hmm. to develop all of the systems together. Yeah. Uh, some of the systems that people don't really think about is uh, the thermal issues, for yep. example. Yeah. Uh, so there's a real systems problem. How do you integrate the thermal issues with the uh, electrical issues? And where does that waste power go from all of, the, <laughs> uh, all of that part where efficiency is not equal to 100%? So yeah, yeah, no, thermal and other system issues are critically important, but <laughs> you need a system before you can really develop those. Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of the point of bringing this community together and why we had the other focus group leads speak as well to try to have as much of that systems approach um, as possible. So thank you. Um, let's see. Um, trying to find a good one that would be uh, there for us. Um, so here's one from um, uh, Jan Van Baleen. Uh, do you think that uh, the impact of continuous versus partial power beaming uh, differs on the technologies proposed? I guess maybe that's, um, um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of exactly how that functions, but go ahead, you can go ahead and answer if you have some idea of exactly. Uh, well, the main place that that differs is in two regions. One is if you are beaming to rovers, the question is, do you beam continuously to rovers as they're operating? which gives you a little bit of problem with tracking, but not very much. Rovers don't move fast enough that they're hard to track. Uh, there's hundreds of people who can give you optical tracking solutions for that. Uh, more of a problem is pointing the receiver on the rover uh, at the laser as you're moving. Uh, that could just be mechanically complicated. A simple solution to that is that you operate on batteries when you're moving. If you look at something like the Mars Exploration Rovers, <laughs> turn out to be the rovers that I know most about, is they might spend typically on a typical day, they'll spend 15 minutes moving and then uh, 
23 hours and 50 minutes uh, stationary doing science. So the easy solution is uh, you stop, you point your receivers at the laser, uh, possibly just by pointing at, by rotating the rover. I mean, the rover has wheels anyway, uh, and then you beam it. So that would be the question, continuous versus discontinuous. Another reason you might like discontinuous is, well, what if you have five rovers uh, exploring the crater? If you have one, uh, why not have lots? In that case, each rover only gets power one fifth of the time. Uh, so there, yeah, there are reasons that you might want to not beam continuously. Uh, another reason is actually, what if your power system is a, a you're trying to beam, uh, say, a kilowatt, but your power system's a 200 watt power system. Well, you run the batteries up, you charge it up, and then you send the kilowatt. So there, there may be reasons for discontinuous power beaming. Sure, yeah, and I guess you've got there, you're showing in your, in your final slide, multiple rovers being powered, but that could be <laughs> sequential as well. Mm -hmm. Good. So uh, one question is at uh, the risks to human health associated with wireless power beaming. I think this is maybe to address a concern that's kind of maybe more towards the general. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there are definitely risks to human health. Uh, probably, actually, Paul Jaffe is the real expert on that because he's been putting together systems that operate in uh, sort of the same uh, square mile radius as actual human beings. Uh, for lasers, the worst problem is uh, optical considerations hitting your eye. Uh, and that can be ameliorated simply if you put a laser reflective coating uh, on all of the space helmets of the humans. Uh, there are other possible considerations. Uh, probably for these particular beaming systems, you're not running into the super high energy density uh, per square meter that you're you're worried about, uh, but yeah, anything that sends beams can have uh, have health considerations. Likewise, microwave beaming the uh, two problems. Uh, one problem is simply going to be heating. Uh, if you walk into the beam, you're going to be stressing the thermal control uh, on your space suit. Uh, presumably, there will be interlocks that turn off the the beam uh, if a human gets anywhere near it. And of course, uh, microwaves also can be, uh, have bad effects if they start illuminating something made out of metal. Uh, so you're going to be starting heating any metal that might stray into the beam. Uh, and that will have to be looked at uh, at the systems engineering level. And there will certainly have to be interlocks and safeties that make sure that, uh, well, if something is between the, the beam and the receiver uh, maybe you should think about uh, automatically turning the beam off. Yeah, that makes sense. Certainly. Um, there's a question about um, optic to optic relays. So how would the efficiency uh, uh, be related to, you know, redirect, say, a laser power if you didn't have a line of sight? I think that's what the, the question is going to be. You said yeah. already mirrors are extraordinarily efficient. Yeah, mirrors are extraordinarily efficient. You will, of course, have to have good surface quality and uh, good aiming, <laughs> the mirrors are going to have to be aimed. So that's one possibility. A lot of people uh, actually in an earlier challenge, I think the big idea challenge, if I remember right, uh, we're looking at the question of building big towers, uh, either towers that have mirrors on the top of them uh, or possibly towers where the laser is actually at the top of it in order to improve that sight line from uh, the lunar horizon that's uh, really pretty close. <laughs> We're talking about kilometer distances here, not necessarily just because we want to make it easy, but if you're trying to beam 10 kilometers on the moon, uh, you've got to put your, your laser up on top of a, on top of a tower. So uh, I'm not sure if that answered the question or not, but yes, it is possible to redirect uh, lasers. And for that matter, it's possible to redir redirect microwaves as well mm -hmm. by, uh, by reflectors. So it's a doable thing. Okay. Um, there's a couple questions that are uh, related to uh, the sort of the full mission, which is technology development, demonstration, and deployment, um, or integrating uh, ancillary services uh, from Gary. So I wonder if you have 
um, anything that you can say about that? I mean, we've already spoken for the need of the systems approach, but how, how to design a mission for this. Yeah, I don't, for some reason in this screen, I don't have see the, oh, maybe if I stop share, it'll show me the, the question. Yeah, sometimes I have trouble seeing both the chat and the Q&A. Is that in chat or Q&A? So this would be in the, in the Q&A, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's a, continues to be a question on the systems engineer now looking into the whole con ops yeah. uh, for the system. Uh, everything about the system gets designed to the con ops, the mm -hmm. conceptual operations. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not sure if I can say much more than uh, absolutely we've got to, got to do that. But to a large extent, the con ops is going to be driven by what the technology can give us. Yeah. There's always that question of technology push or mission pull. Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, you have to satisfy both. <laughs> the mission has to make sense yeah. and the technology has to work. Uh, at the moment, we're still trying to make sure that technology works. And, mm -hmm. uh, but then we will develop the con ops to fit the, to fit the technology. I think that's a great, a really great summary for it. Um, I'm curious if you know of uh, pathways for increasing those, you know, where you could buy down some of those those critical parameters for uh, for the lasers on the laser side. I've seen some interesting things. So, you know, the big revolution right now in solid state is topological mm -hmm. uh, materials, and there's topological lasers and topological everything. I'm wondering if you have some insight into these advances. I will actually postpone that question to Phil Lubin's talk uh, because he is seriously the laser expert. Okay. Uh, I, am, I am but an amateur on lasers compared to Phil. So I'm, I'm sure he can answer that question in, uh, in much more detail than I. So, uh, so stay tuned for tomorrow's uh, feature attraction. Wonderful, yeah, I will definitely be here. Um, Let's see, I'll, I'll try to clear out some of these questions and see if there's a couple more. We can also take a little bit of time before, uh, before the next talk so we're not um, you know, overly stressing ourselves. <laughs>